So now it's my great pleasure, pleasure to introduce Susan Israel and Kelly Fellon, who are joining us today to present some of their work um, in Massachusetts and elsewhere in the US. And uh, I think you've all read both of their bios through our email and the page. So I'll just say that Susan is the president and founder of Climate Creatives. It's an organization based in Massachusetts. And she's been working extensively with Kelly over the past uh, couple of years on one particular project that Kelly will be telling you all more about. So we've had a few technical difficulties and I just wanna check that um, Susan, you're good to go and maybe yes. you can unmute and I'll stop sharing and um, you can take over at this moment. Okay, great. And I will share. All right, so everyone can see that? Yeah, we're great. Okay, great. Well, thank you all for coming. I'm really excited about the interest in this topic and really happy to be here. Um, I'm going to set my timer, sorry, just stop so that I don't run over. Okay, uh, so Climate Creatives, um, uh, as Justine said, Climate Creatives is my organization. And what we do is we use art and design to engage people on climate and sustainability issues. And most of what we do is very experiential. So we have two arms. One is participatory public art, and that's the public outreach arm. And the other is workshops. And they're customized to the organization or the group or the situation because they can use, be used anywhere from um, public programming to internal corporate engagement programs to schools. Um, our history is that we've been doing this for about 10 years. We've reached over half a million people on site plus digital impressions, which we don't track. And we've worked with over 120 different types of partners and that can be organizations or individuals or institutions or community groups, municipal partners, um, really from every sector uh, and of every size. And we find that by working with partners, it's very strategic, we're able to scale more rapidly and have a much deeper impact. My history is that I started as an architect for over 20 years. I started a green practice around 2008, 2009. I was reading Al Gore and Thomas Friedman and got really panicked about the climate. And I, my clients just did not share that kind of anxiety. And I found that nobody did, that we had all this data um, and people were not paying attention to it. And what I was thinking is we have a cultural problem. We have a behavior change problem. Um, we have something which can't be solved but because you need an emotional connection, you can't really solve it by just having more data. First of all, people were questioning the data and then they would say, oh, it's just too, still look at our budget process right now, it's too expensive. Um, and then feeling like I'm just so tiny, you know, it's such a huge problem. I can't possibly contribute to something like climate change. I'm just me. And then quickly going to apathy. And because there has been so much information coming out lately with dire predictions, People really don't want to listen to it anymore. They don't want to think about it. And so the challenge is how do you reach people and change all of those internal conversations and that complete hopelessness to what can I do? And everybody at whatever level they choose to engage with climate can do something. And so that's the conversation that we try to do is that first step to try to get people interested in it committed to it and doing something and feel like from there it will grow. So the public outreach that we do is typically done through public art projects. We've done um, different kinds. This is Broward County, which was mentioned and we'll talk about it some more. Um, uh, and we, we do look at other issues like uh, renewable energy and biodiversity and um, heat island effect but I'll be talking about rising waters primarily today. So the first installation was at Harbor Arts in East Boston. If any of you are from 
the Boston area might be familiar with it. It's a pretty cool thing. And I was walking around, it's on the waterfront um, as an architect thinking, oh, where sea level rise, where, where's the water going to be? And I started drawing lines on the site in my mind and then was able to draw them on this dock and actually talk to people about what six feet of sea level rise might look like on that dock. And I got an incredible response. People were blown away because it had been so abstract to them up to that moment. It was like, eh, but I just got an incredible reaction. So I kept going, this is Maverick Square in East Boston also. This artwork was made um, with a teen workforce from a local CDC. And I, I sort of set it all up with the materials and showed them how to make it. We put it in the T station there. That's our, our rapid transit here in Boston. And uh, well, not rapid, that is our slow public transit here in Boston. And um, also in the community health center. And it was the focal point for a storm resiliency community outreach effort by the local CDC and different agencies in Boston and Massachusetts, because East Boston is very low lying and in a storm, a huge storm hazard area and had just missed Sandy by five and a half hours. This is where the water would have been if Sandy had hit uh, at high tide. Um, there was a big campaign to tell people how to protect themselves from storms and from flooding in particular. And so we had the, 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 storm, the event itself was in the community health center. The artwork was up for about a month. It was interesting because at the T they said, you know, this artwork is gonna be vandalized by, by tomorrow morning. You know, yeah, I know we can't make any promises but we can guarantee you it's gonna get ruined. Um, nothing was touched for a month until we took it down. The community loved having it there. And this is a woman on her way home with her groceries. And she said, will you take my picture? And people were excited to have the information brought to them, to have the spotlight put on the problem, to have it brought to their attention and to have the artwork made by the community. So again, it wasn't us making the artwork, it was the community making the artwork with us. We've, we tried a bunch of different iterations. This was another one, which was kind of fun. Um, and we worked with different, we've worked with um, nonprofits, school kids, high schools, college students, environmental groups, all different kinds of organizations in making and installing the artwork. Uh, and so that has become hard baked into our process. This is at the UMass JFK stop on the T. And then this is Macmillan Pier in Provincetown, which gets 100,000 visitors every year. And so again, by being strategic, and there was signage that explained what it meant. So by being strategic about where this is put, and how it's placed, the impact can be increased exponentially. Um, this was on the San Blas Islands uh, where I went in 2017 and worked with a community there to install it. That's somebody's house in the background. And I, that was my helper. He actually helped me put the artwork in. And I did a workshop with, uh, with the kids there. They spoke Guna, I spoke English. Nobody really spoke Spanish, which should have been the translation language. So we basically did it without language, but it was a, really a response workshop, uh, which has also become something which we tie into a lot of our, our work at this point. And this is in Hong Kong. So I worked with the students remotely and then I went there for the installation, but they did the messaging within their school to the parents and to the student body at an assembly so again, the messaging was coming from inside. It was not somebody from the outside coming in and saying, look at this, you need to do this. This was somebody from inside who embraced it. And uh, these two kids are lovely. They've gone on to do climate work ever since then. I'm actually talking to the Hong Kong Maritime Museum tonight, which was one of the outcomes of this, where they're going to um, do a permanent installation. They're on pilings overhanging Hong Kong Harbor so they wanna paint it permanently on those pilings as part of their renovation. So that's really exciting. Um, Broward County was the first project that we did that used our model to scale with train the trainer uh, workshops and materials and kits of materials. And so we went down there in 2020, in January, which was 
um, just before COVID and showed where future flood levels will be in these decades. That's what the project has always been, but we've gotten it to be much more locked in with these materials and these graphics so that there's some kind of consistency from project to project. And um, it's showing flood levels. So it's not showing sea level rise, it's showing storm surge, sea level rise, rain, and high tide. Altogether, um, these are the future flood predictions, not at the worst case scenario. I think this was a middling scenario. And we worked with the uh, Broward County STEM department and resiliency office and used the Florida Compact data for this. And so this was at the Museum of Discovery and Science. We did the installation as a demonstration in the courtyard to show students what it was. There were 800 students from a, sum, a student summit there. And we did workshops to show them how to do the installation themselves. We also uh, trained them how to do these fish flags, which is another version of the installation. And so they have materials now, because of COVID, they couldn't install in the spring of 2020. They have materials to do installations in 16 schools and city buildings for both fish flags and stripes. They'll do some combination of them um, the first week of November to promote COP26 and their King Tide. So I'm really excited because that will be our first real scale version of rising waters and that's the model we're using going forward and that was done really we just had to have a webinar and some materials to freshen up and they're ready to go the fish flags are used when there's no infrastructure when there's no hardscape to attach a line to and so they use construction flags they're different levels to show the different heights just like the lines do and incorporated in these is a do one action do one thing action campaign which is also a social media campaign. So what we do is for all of our installations, we work with the groups, go over what are things that can be done around climate change and sustainability. And this is the part that is so essential because if you just show the bad news, people shut down. But if you give them something to do and you give them some feeling like they have some agency around this and uh, it becomes very empowering. And so we work with groups about with what are different things you can do, even if it's eat less meat, it has to be starting where that group is, not some unrealistic starting point. And they choose what their personal action commitment is, and they write it down, or they tweet it out, or they put it on Instagram. But in this case, they put it right on the flag. And that's part of what um, the construction of the flag is. And then that becomes a message in the community. And in fact, this picture was after they did the installation and left it up for a little while, a couple of families wandered by and they were actually reading flag by flag what the action items were. On the Rising Waters website, we collect all of the projects. And then, so if you click on one of these, you get more photographs, more information, the story behind the project. And we're going to start to include more of the process from different organizations and create some opportunities for different groups to come together and meet each other and share best practices and be a resource for each other. So our Rising Waters website is an ongoing resource and it also has educational information on it for groups to refer to as does the Climate Creatives website. So we have some large collaborations on the books, which I'm really excited about. Um, one of them um, is Buzzards Bay, Massachusetts, and we've uh, brought together 15 organizations who want to do rising waters around Buzzards Bay using the fish flags. We had it set up for, for this coming year. It might be the year after because we're looking for funding, but we have a range of community groups, city offices, um, UMass Dartmouth, all different kinds of partners in this collaboration. So again, it brings together and connects different groups of people in a location, which also builds some social resiliency on the ground. And we're going to be doing a deeper dive with them about resiliency planning and storm uh, planning, working with them with their flood maps to show 
where their hazard areas are from their, their MVP plan, the municipal vulnerability planning um, documents. We're doing a similar project in Water Fire, uh, which is in Providence, Massachusetts, and they light, they, they actually burn logs in the river. It's pretty cool. They do firings on uh, weekend nights in the summer. They also have a large art center. So we'll be doing some combination of programming at the art center with different groups, bringing them in, always everything with an educational component, working with the schools either in the art center or in the schools and doing fabric hangings of rising waters along the river walk where water fire will be uh, or will where it is um, for next summer. And they're going to make climate change and sea level rise and um, the whole climate conversation a focal point for their season. They're typically just an arts organization but they're using rising waters as an anchor to bring all these conversations to different parts of the community. It's complicated there. It's very complicated. I, I had a, an hour and a half meeting hearing about how complicated it is uh, with the messaging, or, or even with, uh, uh, particularly with extremely knowledgeable groups. So it'll be interesting. We had um, plans to do something again in Panama at a UNESCO site and work with the schools and have them do a big fish flag um, installation in parks and at a UNESCO site and something planned for the Netherlands to project um, rising waters on the Nemo is their, their um, science museum and something in Malaysia, but COVID, 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 COVID. So all of that is on hold indefinitely. Some of the other projects I said we're working on are a tree canopy project tied to Heat Island, which will really let people experience the heat. So again, it's also experiential, but public art made through a public process. Um, and uh, Backburnered is an air quality project that helps people visualize where ultra, the level of ultrafine particles um, for communities who are living particularly near, near airports. Um, so it's not background air pollution, it's that sort of ultrafine particle that you might actually be able to protect yourself from. The other thing that we do is work, as I said, with organizations and um, with corporations, uh, between organizations and with the public in doing bespoke workshops. These are workshops that embed a question. So we have a prompt that they have to solve and design. It might be, what is the solution for your organization to cut carbon on the assembly line or to make it more specific, to draw people to your green team or communicate your ESG go goals or develop a uh, culture around climate change and sustainability that embeds sustainability thinking in all of your work. And we're consulting to um, an architecture firm at the moment about embedding sustainability thinking culturally across the firm and in all of their operations. And the way that we do this is we put people in small teams. They have to build a model that represents their solution. And what that does is it means they have to get to an endpoint. They get out of their comfort zone. They have to use different language. They walk away with more than just a post-it. They have to give it a title and a plan and a little bit of a background story. And it's really, really, really fun. Everybody has a great time. It's super energizing. Again, you have to give people something positive and have fun and have some hope or they're just going to shut down on the conversation. And we also work with uh, universities. So this came out of an Emerson College um, design studio seminar that we did with, and this was a storytelling project in which they wanted to capture people's stories about the landscape where they came from. So that was interesting. We also created, um, because of COVID, a digital way to do all of these projects. So this is a virtual uh, project, Quarantine Quilts. We do the exact same process, but it's online working in breakout rooms and the output is a collection of visual images rather than a model. And we hit other topics like this one has uh, um, public health, there was equity and public health. So there was nutrition, mental health, clean water, and then 
what compels you about climate change. And each of these quilts was made by a small team of three. Um, uh, and so that, that is the, the output instead of the model. And then finally, the project that um, Kelly's going to talk about is rising our first permanent rising waters installation besides the painted lines is going into Braintree, Massachusetts. You can see, I apologize, it's fuzzy on the bottom, but that stainless steel sculpture goes from 23 at the 2030 at the bottom to 2070 at the top. Um, Kelly's going to explain why we do why we did that and where it is. But the top is just an outtake from that process, which was a lot of fun, except can you say navigational hazard? So that one didn't happen. We are hoping to do it in some other format in some other venue. Um, but with that, I am going to turn this back to Justine, stop sharing my screen, and I'm really looking forward to your questions and comments. Thank you, Susan. Kelly, I think you can go ahead and just share your screen directly. All right. How's that? Can you see my screen? Yeah, perfect. Okay. All right. Well, thanks for having me. I'm really honored to be joining Susan today and presenting. Um, a little bit of geographic context is Braintree is a small city about um, 12 miles south of Boston. Population is about 40,000 people. And Watson Park, which is our project site, is an 18-acre park located on the tidal <clears throat> Weymouth Four River. The park has excuse me, park has uh, eight baseball fields, a playground, a splash pad, a basketball court, tennis courts, and a walking trail along the river. And it's really a, a valued resource in the community. We, in 2017, the town completed a climate vulnerability assessment and action plan, which looked at flooding. Um, we use modeling for the Boston region, which includes storm surge as well as sea level, sea level rise and provides projections for probabilities and depths of flooding in 2030 and 2070. Based on that modeling, the park has a 50% chance of, annual chance of flooding by 2030, not too far away. And shortly after we completed that plan, we saw the park flooded twice uh, in the winter of 2018 due to storm surge from nor'easters. So these storms really made it obvious that this is, this is happening. We really need to kind of start to think about the future of the park. In addition to the flooding, we have an erosion problem. Uh, the coastal bank is eroding or an old seawall ends and the unarmored bank begins. You can see here we're kind of a few inches from losing that split rail fence, uh, which keeps people from going into the off the bank. So at that point, we applied for and received a grant from Mass Coastal Zone Management to do two main tasks. <clears throat> Excuse me. One was an evaluation of the potential for salt marsh migration into the park with sea level rise, which I'll talk more about in a minute. But the second was to uh, look at options to stabilize the eroding shoreline with a living shoreline option. I'm sure many of you here are familiar with that, so I won't belabor it, belabor it but it's a uh, living shoreline incorporates natural vegetation alone or in combination with some type of harder structure like oyster reefs or rock sills. There are multiple benefits to living shorelines. Um, this is a great slide from NOAA, which shows the concept and the benefits. We started working with consultants from Woods Hole Group on the project. They did a detailed analysis of historical erosion of the salt marsh. Uh, their analysis showed basically that the blue line in the top photo shows the extent of marsh in 1995, while the red line in the bottom photo shows the extent of marsh in 2018, and the green lobes are the areas of marsh to be restored as part of this project. So you can see quite a change. Um, there's also a stormwater outfall in the center of those two green lobes. So the erosion is caused by the stormwater outfall, the edge effect of the end of the seawall, and wave action, particularly from the um, boat wakes from the marina just uh, adjacent to the site. So the final design uh, includes several components, restoring salt marsh, stabilizing the bank, uh, constructing a flood protection berm, and constructing rain garden, constructing rain gardens to treat the runoff from the park. So this cross section shows, shows the whole project. Um, we start with the, a rock sill at the riverward side of the project. Um, 
since we know the marsh has been eroding, a critical part of this is this rock sill to, to help ensure that the marsh doesn't erode once we reconstruct it. And the hope is that the sill is colonized with oysters, barnacles, and macroalgae and serves as habitat. So approximately 4,300 square feet of marsh will be restored. Um, next, the eroding coastal bank, it'll be cut back to a less steep grade, seeded with a coastal plant seed mix and covered with an erosion control blanket. And then the flood protection berm is proposed uh, in the upland with the existing walking path to be re relocated to the top of the berm. The berm is intended to protect the park from smaller, more frequent storms for the next few decades, but it is intended to be removed when daily tides reach the level of the field to allow for salt marsh migration. So the berm is an interesting part of the project, and I think in some ways it sends a little bit of a mixed signal that we can protect from sea level rise and storm surge when we, maybe we can for the next few decades, but not in, you know, at some point we, we can't stay ahead of it. Um, and there's also a concern, of course, that future town officials won't want to remove the berm or will try to make it permanent or higher. But it was included uh, for two main reasons. And one is that our public works and recreation department are strongly in support of it because it means less maintenance of the fields. Um, being, you know, when they're flooded with salt water, it uh, destroys the grass basically. So it buys us some, some time. Um, and the other reason is based on simple topography is that the marsh won't be able to migrate landward until there's about a three foot increase in sea level, which is projected to be about 2070 based on that modeling that we use. This is based on a high, um, a high scenario, based on a high emissions trajectory. So it's kind of the worst case scenario. scenario. Um, the elevation of the park is at eight feet. High tide right now is at 4.8 feet. So we have, we have three feet and several decades to adapt and again, the intention is to remove the berm um, at that point where the, the tides can reach the, the, the field. Um, what else will I say? Yeah, so, so this, this slide shows like a concept of the future of the park where the path is relocated to the outer edge of the park and would be, uh, the berm is relocated to the outer edge of the park and can serve as protection for the neighborhood behind the park. Uh, some of the higher elevation fields can still be used but most of the interior middle of the park would become salt marsh. Um, during permitting with the Conservation Commission, these concerns about the berm came up and the trade-off was that if we're, if we're going to have a berm, then let's use this for education. Uh, let's have a really strong educational effort on the purpose of the berm and the intention that it be removed come, come uh, 2070 or whenever that tide level reaches the field. So at that point, is that's when I reached out to Susan, knowing, uh, knowing her work. We obviously wanted something that was really gonna have an impact, not just some signage, but something that would be creative, get people's attention, help them um, visualize the changes. So um, the commission funded the contract with Susan. She attended six or seven meetings with the commission over several months um, to get feedback and get their approval. And this is the final design that we arrived at. We looked at several versions, including those, those big numbers that Susan showed, which I love because they're so bold, but they were just not, we couldn't, the permitting for that was not feasible. So um, we went with a slightly scaled back model. Um, one issue of course is the permitting. We have, to, we have, the structure has to be above the high tide line. We had permit from the Army Corps for the salt marsh project. We didn't want to go back and amend that to, to be in, in their jurisdiction. So we're just outside of it. Um, and so we're still working out the details. Uh, but yeah, that just shows the elevation that we're just outside the uh, outside the high tide line, which is the dotted blue, blue line here. The sculpture footprint is this little red um, line. So we're still working out the details of how we're going to use the sculpture, but I'm hoping that we can use it in a, um, as a reference point for citizen science, Mass Coastal Zone Management uses this My Coast app, which you may have seen. This allows users to upload photos. And the app provides background data such as tide level from the nearest tide gauge and uh, other information. So this is a screenshot from that app um, of another site in Braintree during a king tide. We're going to encourage people to use the app, submit, submit photos of the sculpture at the highest high tides. And it will collect data, but more importantly, it will hopefully raise awareness of the issue. And I think particularly we need to get younger generation of people involved in this because they will be the decision makers in 40 or 50 years when the time comes to remove the berm. 
Uh, we have finalized funding. So uh, thanks to another grant round from Mass Coastal Zone Management. So we'll be going out to bid soon and we plan to start construction in the spring. Uh, and I'm just gonna close with this photo of some high school students walking along the trail. This is just downstream of the Project Locust, enjoying the estuary environment on a beautiful day, much like today. Uh, so aside from all the coastal resilience benefits of salt marshes, they are uniquely beautiful environments. So it's just another reason for people to value them and protect them. Thank you.